Anna Harkey has been reviewing books for Dallas audiences for over 10 years. She has a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Liberal Arts degrees from SMU. She's been a teacher in public schools, private schools, and preschools. She often equates teaching students to entertaining with book reviews. Dana loves introducing new stories to her audiences from books you may not have read. Besides being very active in her church, Dana has also recently been president of two garden clubs. She's a Meals on Wheels volunteer and on the board of Wesley Rankin Community Center. Nowadays, she reads, goes to Zoom lectures and meetings, and cooks a lot. Uh, growing up on a farm in Arkansas, she opted for the big city where she married Jackson Harkey, who has become her tolerant tech crew for book reviews. So if any pictures are in the wrong place in her presentation, it's his responsibility. Uh, they're the parents of two adult children, in-laws to two great spouses, and grandparents to three terrific grandchildren. Please welcome Dana Harkey. Today I'm going to tell you a story about an emperor from Japan in 1871 who chose five little girls to send to America to learn about American ways, Western ways. They were going to cross the Pacific Ocean, the vast expanses of post-Civil War America, uh, on the recently completed Transcontinental Railroad. They were going to arrive in Washington, D.C., where they would be almost like a sideshow, put on exhibition for everybody to see. And ultimately, they were supposed to become educated in Western ways with and watch what Western women did so they could return to their homeland and share that knowledge. And while they were in America, like all children, they were greatly influenced by their surroundings. Although each of them were purebred daughters of the samurai, they became hybrids. Uh, ten years later, after being in America for ten years, they did return to Japan and their homeland, and it was almost an alien country to them. They'd been in America for ten years. They'd forgotten how to read and write in Japanese. But what an adventure. And when I saw this book reviewed in the New York Times, I knew I had to read it. Janice Nomura is the author of this book. When she was an undergraduate at Yale, she met a Japanese student there. After they graduated, they married and went to live in Japan for three years. The author learned to read and write in Japanese, and she returned to the United States for grad school with her husband after those three years. Her mentor told her uh, she wanted, knew she wanted to be a writer and her mentor told her that she should go to grad school in what she wanted to write about, not how to write. And so she decides she's going to major in, American, in Asian studies. While she is researching a topic for her thesis, she goes to the New York City Society Library. It's a very small private library. And she sees a book, a shelf of beautiful books. They're beautifully bound. Uh, and they're all about Japanese travel. They have interesting, intriguing titles like Behind the Bamboo Curtain, Japan's Majesty, and then she finds a very slim volume that's titled A Japanese Interior by Alice Mabel Bacon. And she can tell that this is an old book. She opens it and it's published in America in 1888. Alice wrote in the preface, the author, uh, that she went to Japan to teach in a girls' school and she lived not with strangers, but with friends of long standing. Well, Janice Nomura was blown away. First of all, a girls' school in Japan, and then friends of long standing of Japanese origin in 1888, and a Westerner with such friends. Here is her story. This is what she's going to write about. So before we get started, I need to give you a short Japanese history lesson. Our story takes place in 1868 through 1912. And that is the era in Japan that was the era of the uh, Meiji Emperor. Uh, here you see this picture is an emperor in traditional Japanese clothing on one side and Western clothing on the other side. Truly, he was a man between two civilizations. Prior to this period, Japan had experienced 250 years of peace, but it was largely isolated from the rest of the world. Once a year, a ship, usually a Dutch trading ship, was allowed into Edo Harbor. Edo was the capital city. It was the traditional name of Tokyo. Well, Japan even had no navy. That's how isolated they wanted to be. They didn't want to communicate with the rest of the world. And there they were, an island nation with no na uh, navy. If a fisherman became shipwrecked on some isolated island and was saved by a 
Western ship, they could not return to Japan. They would not have been welcome to come back to Japan. There were a few Christian missionaries that had found their way to Japan, but they were, uh, if they formed any converts at all, they were often persecuted and executed. But in 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry, no, not the don't give up your ship Perry, but his younger brother, sailed into Edo Harbor. He had two steamships with him and two men of war, so he came loaded for bear. Uh, this is a picture of Japanese uh, origin of Commodore Perry's ship and, and the arrival. Intent, the intent of coming into this harbor was to force the Japan into a trading agreement with the United States. Uh, and they did it with these gunships, so they, it was really a matter of force. But the Japanese considered the smelly, unwashed, bearded seamen to be barbarian. Uh, they didn't like them. They didn't want to communicate with them. The arrival of Perry's fleet was known as the arrival of the black ships. And you can see in this picture uh, made by the Japanese how evil they thought they were. They called them black ships because they belched that black smoke from the coal coil. Coal fuel that they used to travel. Just before this time, Japanese had been ruled by a weak emperor who answered to the strong men of the country, the samurais. They kept the peace by authoritarian rule. Now the shoguns and the samurai were weakened by younger men who saw the ability to trade with other countries and to find out what was happening as a benefit to their nation. So there was dissension among the feudal lords. Those who believed that the Western influence, trading, guns, Christianity, would shift the balance in this system, and those that wanted to see it happen. All of this ultimately resulted in the downfall of the shoguns and the samurai. War was inevitable, and the shoguns and the, and the samurais took sides, and the idea and the practice of the shogunate was going to fall. Uh, the winners were going to demand the return of the emperor as a deity with a new centralized government run by uh, powerful men, and the emperor would simply be its symbolic head. The government would be controlled by the winning samurai, and they would ultimately open trade to Japan from the West and other Western influences. Actually, guns were a big incentive. Some of you might remember a movie from many years ago with Tom Cruise, and that was about this period of history where uh, the, during the war that was going to happen and make the decision of whether it was going to be open to the West or not. Well, the people who wanted it open won. And so the government, in the emperor's name, the government was going to send people, emissaries, usually always men, all over the West to learn things. And then what are you going to do with this new knowledge? It's going to happen in every aspect of society in Japan. And so that's the situation that, uh, as it was when someone noticed that in the West, women are different and they treat, are treated different. They have opinions. They support their husbands socially and intellectually. They can actually influence uh, their husbands. They can exert that influence. Is this an idea to explore? The Japanese asked themselves. And the saying went, with a little yeast, Japan will rise. So yes, they wanted to find out as much as they could. And so they decide that they're going to send five little girls. The youngest that they chose was six. The oldest was 14. The one thing that these little girls had in common is that their fathers were on the losing side of the war. And the other thing they had in common was that they all had siblings and more important, brothers. They could be spared. They had learned discipline. They had learned loyalty. They had earned res they knew responsibility. One had even been wounded when her family's castle had been under sage in the Samurai Wars. These families could risk a daughter to help restore their family's prestige and honor. And so with the Emperor's blessing, five little girls are going to set out for America with the Iwakura mission. This is an impressive group of men led by men who had already been abroad uh, they spoke competent English, and they're going to become leaders in the new government. They're accompanied by the man who had been the American ambassador to Japan for the last two years and his wife. 
and the ambassador and his wife, Ambassador and Mrs. DeLong, are going to serve as chaperones to the five little girls. Now this is a picture of the Iwakura mission. Notice the man in the center who is in traditional Japanese attire, but look at what he's wearing on his feet. He has leather shoes. Uh, and he's standing amidst the other men who pose stiffly in their American cravats. At a state dinner the night before this mission set, sets out, the emperor addresses his court with startling frankness for the emperor. He said, if Japan wants to profit from modern advances in arts, science, and industry, they must send an expedition of practical observers, and that's what this Irakura is supposed to be. They need to get the things that the Japanese people lacked. He also said after 250 years of staying home that going abroad may tempt the travelers, much like strong drink, he said, but it should be sampled sparingly. And then surprisingly for the time, he went on to say, we lack superior institution for female culture on which the happiness of daily life frequently depends. How important is the education of mothers in whom future generations will rely? Very unusual for him to mention women at the time, but knowing that these little girls were going with the mandate to learn about Western ways for women. Now, none of the men in the Iwakura mission took their wives with them. The emperor had said that would be fine. In fact, he urged them to do so. Uh, because it was important to uh, learn these Western ways, but the men in this mission decided that the, let the vanguard be the expendable younger daughters of other men. So no, no wives went with them. So who are the lucky five little girls? Here's a picture of those little, little girls. We know the most about the one in the middle who's seated in the middle. Her name is Stematsu Yamakawa. Stematsu was her family name, and her family had been at the losing end of the war. They lived in the isolated northern province, and nobody in the family had ever seen a foreigner. Stematsu was wounded in a siege. She had seen her sister-in-law begging for permission to commit ritual suicide, but died in agony. When the family surrendered, Stematsu was 10 years old and was sent to a prison camp. She was uh, uh, filthy, hungry, covered with lice, when she was finally released with her parents, they went back to Edo, the capital city that's going to become Tokyo. The two older brothers had been released earlier and they had already found jobs in the new administration. There, they proposed their sister for when this emperor sought females to send. One of the brothers, one of the other brothers, had already been sent to the United States where he was studying at Yale. His name was Kinjiro. Now, the two older girls at either end of the uh, picture were already young women. They were 14, Ryo Yoshimasu and Tei Ueda. Uh, they both had traumatic experiences on board the ship when they sailed. Uh, they were encountered by drunken sailors, and we don't know if it was just youthful hijinks among the sailors or if it was really a serious crime, but the offense had been frightening to the girls. A trial was held, but no judgment was reached. These older girls fared no better in America. They were homesick. Ryo had an eye injury. They, when they were traveling across the continent, they, had, uh, they saw snow in Utah, and she got st struck with snow blindness, and it was very uh, badly injured. Her eyesight never really came back. Uh, so it's no surprise when these two got back to, wa got to Washington, D.C., and started going to the dinners, they made the decision, the two of them, that they would go home back to Japan with the men from the mission. These two fade from history at this point. Uh, we do see, see them one more time with the other three as aging matrons back in Japan years later. The three who stayed became lifelong friends. There's little Umi Suzuka. You see her, uh, you, you can tell which one she is because she is the smallest one. She was described as cute as a button. She was barely six years old when they sailed, but she had the advantage of having a father who was familiar with Western ways. He was a failed samurai. He lost in the war, but he was a success in learning Western ways. He sent a trunk with little Ume with an English primer, a book, a Japanese English dictionary, and a red woolen shawl, all very useful items for little Ume. 
Ume could read and write some Japanese, and she could say yes, no, and thank you in English. So she was as well prepared as any of them, even being the youngest. The last girl that you see is on the other side of Stamatz. Her name was Shige Nege. Um, she was between Stamatz and Ume in age. She grew up in Tokyo among elders who were intrigued by Western ways, but decided they would stay loyal to the Shogun. Her father and brother had even been to Europe. But on the losing side of the war, her family endured a short siege in their castle, uh, and after it was over, Shige was taken to see the beheaded heads of some of her relatives posted on spikes outside the castle, and she remembered it later as a terrible sight. After the war, her parents were dead. She was adopted by a doctor uh, and taken to a faraway village. But her brother had gone to Edo and had gotten a job and had submitted the application for her to be part of this program, to be sent abroad. And when she was accepted, a messenger was sent to the uh, doctor in the faraway village and said to a stunned Shige, uh, you're called back to Tokyo and you're going to America. Well, she'd never even heard of America. So it was quite a shock to her. So now the six little girls are going to assemble in Tokyo and meet each other for the first time. The great day came. They all boarded the ship with the men of the Iwakura mission. It was winter of 1871. They're going to cross the Pacific Ocean, vast Pacific Ocean. They're going to endure weeks of seasickness, homesickness, loneliness. They didn't want to eat the, the uh, foreign food that was offered to them, but many well-wishers had sent candy, so they ate candy instead of the food that was offered to them, which didn't help their tummy trouble, problems at all. Their chaperone was Mrs. DeLong. Uh, she was obvious, she's obviously the dour looking woman in the center of this picture. She was returning after two years in Japan. She was not a warm, fuzzy kind of personality. She was hardly the per best person to be the chaperone to these little girls. Uh, she used the girls when she got back to the States to enhance her own social status. She would introduce them as Japanese princesses. She would make them go on exhibition. She'd seat them on the stage in their Japanese finery and, and just set, let people look at them. She only allowed them adult company. She didn't find them any other children to play with. The author disliked her, and it showed in the writing. But sources su supported her surmise. That was uh, what she was reading about everywhere she read. But she was contacted by the great-great-granddaughter of Mrs. DeLong, and she thought, uh-oh, here, this is going to be a problem. She was wary, but she returned the phone call to the granddaughter and asked the grand and said something about, I'm, I'm sorry if I portrayed your grandmother uh, in an unflattering way. And the granddaughter replied, as far as I know and from what I've heard, you've got her exactly right. Japan was an ancient country. It had been together for a long time. America is a brand new country. So there was a lot to learn from both sides. The little girls, after many parties and dinners and exhibitions in San Francisco, the little girls and the rest of the mission board the Transcontinental Railroad. This railroad is only three years old. These people from Japan are probably gonna see more of America than most Americans have seen. They cross the uh, the vast expanses of post-Civil War America. They see majestic mountains. They're snowbound in Utah for several weeks, uh, which then it was a Wild West frontier town, had one town to it. They see the Great Plains. They, find, they see buffalo roaming across these Great Plains. They see things that are just unbelievable to, to them. They finally arrive in Chicago. Now, they, at this point, they're given American clothes and they go to more dinners. Here you see the little girls in their first Western outfits. Finally, they get to Washington, D.C. The two older girls return to Japan and they become a country of three. Now what? What's going to happen to them now? The Japanese government has said they're going to pay for room and board and instruction, but they made no provisions for where the room and board was going to be. Ume, little six-year-old Ume, is almost immediately adopted by a Japanese embassy's American secretary and his wife. They're an older couple and they have no other children. 
uh, they call Ume our little sunbeam from the land of the rising sun. She becomes the spoiled darling only child they had always wanted. Living in Washington, D.C., she meets uh, senators and ambassadors. She sits on Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's lap. Every achievement is recorded in the newspaper. Her uh, piano recital is in the, uh, pictures of the piano recital is in the newspaper. And surprisingly, or perhaps not so surprisingly, because of the influences around her, she becomes a very pious Christian. Uh, and remember, Christianity is still illegal in Japan. With that Christianity, she gets a certain sense of moral superiority. She's raised as an upper-class American girl with all its attendant privileges. Uh, she has, and like upper-class American young women of that time, she has the priorities of intellectual improvement. This is the, the founding of the American women's colleges. This is uh, the blue stocking kind of girls who grew up with all this kind of intellectual ability and, and their intellectual curiosity is encouraged. Uh, and then it's balanced by this kind of Protestant piety where you're convinced of your own righteousness and eager to tell everybody else about it. So that's the situation that little Ume grows up in. Meanwhile, Stematsu and Shinge go to two different homes in New Haven, where Yale is. Remember, that's where Stamat's older brother is going to college. And so here's Kinjiro, who is at the university at Yale. He's a welcome sight. He's someone who looks like them. Uh, Stamatsu had last seen this older brother in the smoking ruins of her family's castle four years ago. Now Kinjiro is to become a mentor and he's going to ease their homesickness and provide a link to their home, homeland. Stamatsu becomes a ward of the Bacon family. Alice Bacon is the daughter, and Alice becomes Stamatsu's best friend and like a foster sister. Leonard Bacon is a pillar of the New Haven community he, uh, and the intellectual elite in New Haven, Connecticut. He's a pastor at the First Congregational Church He's a professor of theology at Yale, and he's a writer and an educator. He looked like a biblical patriarch. He had this long, bushy beard and was very stern looking. But he realized he was going to get the money from Japan, $15 a month, to feed and educate and house his little Japanese ward. But he, he framed it as more familiar, familiar than financial. She would become a part of their family. Uh, Stamatz reciprocated that love and warmth that she found in that family. After just a little bit of English instruction, she was sent to Grove Hill Seminary, which was a very progressive girls' school at that time, and eventually she's going to go to Vassar. This picture at Vassar shows Stamatz kind of on the second row toward the left side. Her head is circled in red. She becomes bright, beautiful, and very popular. She's elected uh, president of the sophomore class. She is in, uh, initiated in the Shakespeare Society and other prestigious clubs, and she even gives the commencement address when she graduates. Both girls ended up in New Haven, but they were sent to separate homes so they wouldn't become totally dependent upon each other. They had to learn to speak English. That was primary, and they both learned fairly quickly. But they still saw each other at social events, uh, intellectual societies, uh, uh, skating parties, and trips with their families to nearby towns and New York cities. They lived a half hour's walk away from each other, so they did see each other, which I'm sure helped a lot. Shige in New Haven enjoys the company of Stamatsu and her older brother, and like Stamatsu, she makes friends and enjoyed the parties, lessons, intellectual pursuits, and friendship of a young crowd of women that ran around together. She went to live with the family of John Stephen Cabot Abbott, who was also a congregational minister, but he was more in the secular vein. He was more of a writer. He wrote books on how-to, on, uh, intellect, on uh, theology, on writing, all of those things he wrote about, and education. He lived in this wonderful grand home. His oldest daughter ran a very progressive girls' school in the home there. With the family, Shigei took trips to Boston, Nantucket, uh, the Berkshires. 
Shigay turns out to be very gregarious. Once she learns to speak English, she has so many friends and she attends church and goes to lots of social activities. Uh, here you see this picture of Shigay. Uh, she lost the distinction of being the only Japanese in her neighborhood uh, in 1875, after she'd been there about four years. Across the street, an aspiring naval cadet moved in with another foster family to live there while he was preparing to attend Annapolis. His name was Sotokichi Uraihu, and he was 18 years old. He'd been highly trained in Japan from the age of 12. He studied English, chemistry, physics, navigation, engineering, all of this he learned in Japan. He was popular and grew fond of Shigei. And after he gets uh, appointed or gets enrolled at Annapolis, he returns to New Haven and keeps up his friendship with Shigei. Shigei's experience is different too because she showed musical talent. She enrolled in Vassar for the three year program for music education. And so she is the first to return to Japan, which happened to coincide with the return of. Naval Officer Sotokichi Uraihu. So they become engaged on the ship back to Japan. She will be married and teach music and Western culture to other Japanese pe people. Here you see Shigei in her wedding dress as she returned to Japan and got married. Stematsu and Ume return at the same time in time for her wedding. It's a year later than, than uh, Shigei. The other two come back. Uh, Stamatsu had graduated from Vassar, but Ume had only had a high school degree. They get back and they go to Shigei's wedding immediately after their return. Shigei is settled. The others, it's not going to be quite so easy. Truth be told, Shigei was content to teach and eager to start a family. Stamatsu and Ume had their sights set on higher things. None of the girls now easily read or spoke Japanese anymore. They'd been gone for 10 years. It never occurred to any of them, however, to stay in America, where they were used to things, where they had friends, where they were accustomed to uh, the customs of America now. But it never occurred to them to stay. They're going to, uh, their samurai training ran deep. Their obligation was to return to Japan and teach other women, teach Japanese women about American ways. Shigei had returned with plans for marriage. The conventional Japanese outlook for marriage was good wife, wise mother. A woman had to be both those things. So that was the conventional outlook. Shigei is going to be just a little bit unconventional. She's going to be a good wife and a wise mother. She and her naval officer husband had six children Almost immediately, they had the first one. But she's going to be unconventional in the sense that she's going to be a working mother. When she married Sotokichi, she was going to become the wife of an ambitious naval officer. But she was also going to be a music teacher. Being a music teacher didn't require reading and writing Japanese. And so it was easy for her to find her calling. She would sponsor balls and entertainments. She wore Paris fashions. She taught Western dance lessons, accompanying herself on the piano. You can see in this picture, she is the one sitting at the piano in the uh, checkered dress playing the piano as the Japanese uh, couples danced a Western waltz. And she taught them all of that. So now she's a working mom, which was unheard of in Japan. At one time, she was the highest paid woman in Japan. Probably she was the only paid woman in Japan. It was also unusual that she married for love. And of course, she'd been with Kotokichi since she was about 16 years old in uh, New Haven and then crossing the Pacific and becoming engaged. Uh, her husband became a very important uh, naval officer, became an admiral in the newly formed Japanese Navy. And he uh, uh, fought several battles during the Russian-Japanese War and was later made a baron. So Shigei had her place in society. She was very important in society as well. Stamatsu, on the other hand, returns to Japan and she is determined she is going to join what the Americans call the Noble Army of Spinsters. There is no word in the Japanese language for an unmarried woman. But the atmosphere in Tokyo is different than it was 10 years ago when she left. 
uh, more reactionary forces have taken over that don't want quite so much to do with the West. They know it's going to happen, but they are more reluctant. And so Stamatsu thinks she's going to come back and have the school ready for her to begin teaching in. She's going to run the school for Japanese girls, teaching them Western ways. Nobody in the government now is interested in starting a school like this. So Stamatsu is left without a job. What is she going to do? Um, she does have a society of friends who become uh, accustomed, that have been a abroad and know a little bit about Western ways. One of the things they do is they put on Shakespearean plays for Japanese people to come see. And she's, but she gets approached several times by the men in these societies wanting to marry her. And she says, no, I'm not going to get married. But an interesting proposition happens to her. While she's playing the role of Portia in a Shakespearean play, there is a man in the audience who sees her. And he decides uh, that he is going, he sends a formal request to Stamatsu's older brothers. His name is Awaya Oyama, and he is the recently widowed Minister of War for all of Japan. Uh, more shocking that, that he's going to ask Stamatsu to marry him is that he was on the other side of the war from Stamatsu's family. And he was the leader of the contingent of Shogun who besieged Stamatsu's family castle. Perhaps he was the one who sent the cannonball over the fence that uh, wounded poor Stamatsu or killed her poor sister-in-law who died in agony. Perhaps he was wounded during that time. Perhaps he was wounded by some of the shells and, cannon and, and bullets that the uh, Stamatsu had loaded and made into ammunition. There was very hard feelings between this man and Stamatsu's family. But Stamatsu finally saw this as an opportunity. Uh, this is going to be a highly unusual marriage. Uh, and the reason is, while Stamatsu was in America learning Western ways, o Oyama had been in Geneva studying European military technology. And he returned with a taste for all things Western and European. Oyama needed a consort who was comfortable with European way and public life and conversant in public affairs. He had three young daughters. He needed a stepmother who could teach them Western ways. Stamatsu was the only woman in Japan with a bachelor's degree. She was tall, slim, elegant, and poised. Look at that portrait of her wearing that beautiful dress. That portrait could have been made in Boston or New York. She spoke English and French. But there's a dilemma. Stamatsu had planned to spend her life promoting women's education, but she had no outlet to do it. There was nowhere to do it. The government is not going to put together this school. She could teach an inferior school, but she really didn't want to do that. She was really too proud. She really wanted to make a difference in Japanese society. She didn't love Oyama, but she had just met him, and he was intelligent and well-respected. She said with him, it would be possible to serve her country in a way she couldn't by herself. And she could be happy and satisfied by teaching and by sponsoring schools for Japanese women and girls. What her quote here, what she said, what she wrote to her friends when she said she was going to get married, which stunned everybody, of course. She said, what must be done is a change in the existing state of society, and this can only be accomplished by a married woman. So it is my fate to be married. And she accepted Oyama's proposal. Here's a picture of Stamatsu in her European-style wedding dress. Now, was she selfish or selfless? She also got a large diamond ring when she married. This white silk wedding dress says that they're going to be married in a Western style wedding. Uh, the announcements were sent to friends in French. Her husband is now high in the ranks and he ultimately becomes a baron and even wealthier. They're going to live in a European style house. It's all just the things that she is accustomed to and wants to do. Stamatz raises Oyama's three daughters and has a son and daughter of her own. She becomes a wealthy benefactor of girls' schools in several places in Japan. She lived in this beautiful Western-style house. She hosted dinners and balls and socials of all kind. She said she would show the great men what a great woman could do. 
uh, she it was not simply about wealth and influence for her. It was a chance to take root. Her later po portraits, just like the one that I showed you, showed this tall, elegant woman in Western clothes, seated, seating, seated formally in a uh, chair. That's how she is remembered in uh, Japan. So poor Umi, what are we going to say about her? She too was determined not to get married, but she couldn't speak or read Japanese anymore. Uh, her two best friends were now married and had children. Her own family expected her to marry and return to the ancestral home to take care of her parents, and preferably she should have a husband in tow with her. She only has a high school degree. She's a pious Christian in a country reluctant to recognize Christians. She's shocked at Japanese morals like men drinking on a Sunday. She has no clear purpose or means. She's awkward in society, and she actually burns with the frustration of the underestimated. In reality, she was a snob. She ruled out teaching at some of those inferior schools um, and even a missionary school, but she finally decides that that is what she's going to have to do. She's going to have to go teach at a missionary school. She goes to one that has been founded by her father. Remember, your father liked Western ways. And so it's a Methodist mission school that her father had helped to found. So she is going to teach there. But she felt it was only a first step in what she really wanted to do. She really wanted to found a school. That's really her, 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 me, her uh, goal in life is to found this school that she sees necessary for Japanese women. So she goes to teach in this school and it's a mixture of pride and disdain. She really sees herself as above this. She is, her privileged Georgetown, Washington, D.C. childhood is left her unprepared for a future like this where she's teaching in a missionary school in Japan that she sees as inferior. The idea of marriage was abhorrent to her. Uh, she's teaching and that's a thankless grind to her. She craves recognition. She wants to be the thing that she's always been trained to be. And she's actually a little jealous of Stamatz. At a social occasion, she runs into Hirobumi Ito. He was one of the ambassadors from the Iwakura mission that she went to America with. He is now the prime minister of Japan. And he gets to talking with Ume and finds out she's unhappy teaching the school. And he invites her to move in with his family and be a governess to her, his daughters. Ume accepts with gratitude. She moves into this house that's actually next door to Stamatsu, and she becomes a governess to the prime minister's daughter. And she writes about her life there with a, uh, the mixture that you would imagine uh, of enthusiasm and complaint. She complains that she can't be doing the things she wants to do, but she gets to go to all these parties and she lives in this beautiful house. About this time, the empress of Japan, that you see in the picture here, beautiful, woman dressed in traditional Japanese attire, decides she's going to found a school for Japanese royal women. Ume, of course, is tapped to teach there and run the school. Stamatz is going to be the primary benefactor. Uh, Prime Minister Ito supports it as well. Stamatsu sponsors a charity bazaar. This is, idea of it is totally new to Japanese women. When Alexis de Tocqueville, the French uh, writer, visited America. He noticed that the women, especially the women in New England, would put on bazaars to earn money for causes like temperance, uh, uh, abolition, education for women. They'd put on these bazaars. He said that was unique in all the world. They certainly had never heard of it in Japan. So Stamatsu, with her New England education, puts on a charity bazaar where the women so exquisite needlepoint and sell it, uh, treats and goodies, homemade, a bake sale, basically a Japanese bake sale happens too. And that's how they raise money for this school. And it uh, is a big success and becomes a yearly event. One of the few places in the world besides New England where we put on charity, where women put on charity bazaars to raise money is Japan. The Pyrrhus School, the, they called it the Pyrrhus School, the, uh, because it was for Japanese royal women. And it taught girls not necessarily to be an independent like Ume had envisioned, but it taught the good wife, wise mother concept. It was very important that that get there. Uh, 
it was a prestigious position, but Ume was very frustrated. The curriculum included Japanese and Chinese literature, English, French, history, morals, how to do a tea ceremony, flower arranging, household management, formal etiquette, and a limited amount of math, just enough to run a household. That was not what Ume had in mind. So Ume begins to float the idea of bringing Alice Bacon. Remember Alice, she's going to write the book, and she is, um, she was Stamatsu's foster sister, and Ume, of course, knew her. So she begins to float the idea of bringing Alice Bacon to Japan. Alice is a spinster, her father has just died, and she would be an intellectual addition to the faculty at Ume's school. She arrives finally to spend a year teaching at this school. She's a great success. Her purpose had been educational rather than spiritual. Uh, Japanese women had only seen women missionaries and Ume, and here comes Alice, and she is more intellectual than the missionary women. And so she has all this information that she wants to teach. And she also has a high-minded idealism that separates her from the merchants and diplomats coming from the West. She's just a different type of woman for the Japanese women to see. When she goes back to the United States, she brings five-year-old Mitsu, who is Ume's cousin. And she formally adopts her when she gets to the United States and raises her just like Ume had been raised. So there's another little Japanese girl that gets to go to America and learn those things. Um, uh, Mitsu stands there for uh, 10 years too, and she's gonna grow up in America and, and become wise in Western ways. When Alice leaves after a couple of years with little Mitsu to go back to the United States, uh, she, uh, Ume decides she's gonna go back too. And she applies to go because she decides she's going to go get a bachelor's degree at, fast, at uh, wherever she can get a scholarship. She does get a scholarship at Bryn Mawr in Philadelphia. And she chooses to study biology. Now one wonders, did she choose it just because she thought she could to show everybody she could do something more than literature? But she ultimately gets a bachelor's degree with honors in biology. She receives a scholarship to Bryn Mawr in Philadelphia. I have to tell you, the dean of Bryn Mawr was a woman named Martha Carey Thomas. And Dean Thomas's uh, motto that she wrote in many papers, she said, only our failures marry. In other words, if you go to Bryn Mawr, you've got this great degree, you've got to do something with it. And if you can't do anything with it, well then I guess you can get married. Nobody is going to try to set Ume up there. No, like she'd been experiencing in Japan where people were kept trying to find her husbands and mate. Nobody's going to set her up at Bryn Mawr. So Ume writes this book with uh, Alice whilst, while she's there in, in, in uh, America. It's called Japanese Girls and Women, but only Alice's name goes on it because nobody wants to, in Japan wants to hear how Ume thinks women should be educated in Japan. So just Alice's name, and it becomes a, you know, a pretty good seller in America because they want to know things about Japanese women. And Alice gets all the credit for it. Uh, Meanwhile, Umi publishes her own biology paper, and her paper is on the orientation of the frog egg from biology. So she really wants to prove herself while she's there. She goes back to Japan with her degree in hand. Uh, she resumes her work at the school, at the Emperor's School, and she begins to work with the newly created American Women's Scholarship Committee. It was formed to find Japanese women to give them scholarships to go to Bryn Mawr, just like Ume did, and she begins to work with them. Uh, Ume is invited back to America after about a year of teaching at the Empress's School, and she goes back to America to address the General Federation of Women's Club in Denver of that year. And she gives several talks and lectures while she's in America. And then she decides to extend her time abroad and goes to London where she presents a lecture series in London too. Uh, she's been gone about a year and she finally goes back to Japan. And she has this high standing now because everybody in Japan's heard of her. She gets this big raise. She teaches us at the Empress's School for another year. And then she decides it's time, finally time to teach her own, to open her own school, and she's going to do that. Ume is finally able to found the Women's Home School of English. Her message there was that women needed education not to challenge men, but to better help them. 
It was safe within the good wife, wise mother idea, but it added that intellectual component that Ume felt was so strongly needed. Eventually, she invites Alice to become the second teacher to come again back to Japan. Umi's school would cultivate thoughtful individuals, not dolls reciting from memory, but women who knew how to reason for themselves, independent of their teachers or husbands. Before Alice goes home this time, the four women, the three girls who had been there, and Alice spend as much time together as they possibly can, knowing that it might be the last time that they see each other. So the three little girls from the Iwakura mission twice uprooted, had flourished and succeeded in achieving the mandate conferred upon them to provide the yeast so Japan could rise, even as their government had lost sight of it. The three remained the closest to friends. Ume's school flourished and still exists today as Tsuda College. Shinge visits America again with her husband, going to Annapolis, New Haven, and Vassar, places that she was familiar with, Stamatz never returned back to America. Stamatz became a widow and suffered the loss of her only son, along with Shigei's only son, oldest son, in an explosion on a naval ship that both those boys were on. Uh, Alice wrote letters of comfort to them both. It was a tragic loss for both of them, and they, they were able to comfort each other. Alice dies in New Haven in 1918 at the age of 61. Stamatz becomes a widow and actually dies in the influenza pandemic, worldwide pandemic, in 1918 as well. She was 60 years old. Shinge, uh, some days after Stamatz died, Ume suffered a stroke and spends the next 10 years of her life homebound at her college. Shige dies of cancer in 1928 at age 68. Ume dies a year after Shinge at age 64. Today, Japanese elementary students study Ume uh, because of her founding of the college, but very few recognize Tematsu and Shinge. Tsuda College thrives that has about uh, an annual enrollment of about 2,500 students, and they study English, math, computer science skills, foreign relations. It's a big school for uh, foreign in, uh, relations. Um, the students sometimes refer to themselves as umikos after ume, and when a final exam or an important paper is due, they will go out under some plump trees near ume's grave to consult with her for help, her help and enlightenment. It's interesting that a hundred years before multiculturalism or globalization became goals of corporations or universities, three Japanese girls spanned the globe and became fluent in two worlds at once. They were the other to everyone except each other. I hope you've enjoyed this true story of Japanese girls who honor their homeland while representing new ideals. Thank you.